Hey guys, um, today we're going to go over chapter 12, which is DNA analysis. Uh, if you've taken biology, this is probably a little bit of re a review and then some new information as well. Uh, so hopefully it'll be fairly interesting. Um, so let's get right into it. All right, so general DNA information, this should be a review, right? So we know that DNA is a double helix, right, which means it's two coiled strands. If you look right here, you can see those two coiled strands. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a twisted ladder structure, and it is composed of nucleotides. So you have four different nucleotide bases. Um, those would be adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, um, which each contain a sugar, which is deoxyribose, okay, a phosphate group, and then a base. So the full name of DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, hopefully you remember that. If not, now you know. Um, and when we talk about the bases, we know that adenine always pairs with thymine and cytosine always pairs with guanine. So in humans, the order of those bases is 99.9% .9 the same. There's only 0.1% that's different between any two people. So think about all the differences between each person just in our class, and that's represented by 0.1% of your DNA, right? All right, so now that we've reviewed DNA, we're gonna talk a little about where it is found, right? So genes are portions of the DNA that code for a specific protein, um, and the DNA is found in nucleated body cells. So nucleated, all that means is that they're cells with a nucleus, right? Um, those include white blood cells, semen, saliva, urine, hair roots, teeth, um, and bone and tissue. The most abundant are in your buccal or your cheek cells. So if you had me for biology, we did a um, cheek cell um, lab where you were actually able to scrape them and stain them and you could see your nuclei, right? And the nucleus is where the DNA is located. Um, DNA obtained from blood comes from white blood cells, not red. So now let's take it over to the forensic side of things. So DNA typing um, is a method in which DNA is converted into a series of bands. And those series of bands can be used to identify an individual. So only one tenth of a percent of DNA, which is about three million bases, um, differs from one person to the next. And scientists look at those regions to help generate a DNA profile. So if you hear about them you know, running the DNA and comparing it, um, this is what they're doing. And we're going to talk about the different processes that they use to um, obtain that information. So 3% of the human DNA sequences code for proteins. 97% is non-coding. It's repetitive. It's the same sequences over and over and over and over again. It's what we refer to as junk DNA. Um, pretty much doesn't do much of anything. 50% uh, of the human genome has interspersed repetitive sequences. So the parts that we're looking at in forensics are going to be those coding sections. So what do we use DNA profiling for, right? So in forensics, we're looking at identifying potential suspects, um, exonerating people who may have been suspects, to identify the victim of a crime, okay, if their body is too far gone that we can't actually get any kind of face, facial recognition, um, to establish paternity. So if you've ever watched Mari, that's what they're doing, right? Um, and then to match organ donors. All right, RFLP. So this is restriction, fragment, length, polymorphisms. So from here on out, we'll just refer to it as our FLP. So this is using restriction enzymes to cut DNA into small fragments. And then those fragments can be separated and characterized and identified. So the four steps to do this would be to isolate. So that's separating the DNA from the cell, um, simply doing a DNA extraction. Cut, which is using restriction enzymes to make short base strands. Sort, uh, this is done using gel electrophoresis, um, which is a method that I'm gonna have a little video for you guys to watch on it. Um, and if we were in class, like, we actually have the machine, but uh, obviously right now we're not. Hopefully we'll get back there. Um, and then we analyze, which uh, uses, looks at the specific alleles and uses them for identification. So here's just a, um, 
chart showing the different restriction enzymes um, and where they cut. So for the BAMHI, it cuts bef between the G and the G in a GGATCC strand. Okay, hey, III cuts between the G and the C in a GGCC. So it would cut right here and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to expect you to memorize these, but it's just showing you where they cut. So the next step would be PCR, which is a polymerase chain reaction. If you had me for biology, we talked about these, um, but it's basically a technique that's used to make a copy of a defined segment of a DNA molecule. Um, so if there's a very small amount of DNA found at a crime scene, they can run PCR on it and make millions of copies of that DNA um, from even one single cell, right? Which is very important if we're gonna be running tests on it we obviously need more than a single strand of DNA. So PCR um, is polymerase chain reaction, and it's used to make copies of DNA. So with PCR um, steps, uh, first and foremost, you're gonna heat the DNA strands, and that causes the strands to unzip. Um, and then you cool the mixture and you add a primer. So that's gonna be a short sequence of pairs um, that add to the complementary sequence of a DNA strand. So for example, if the complementary sequence was AAG, the primer would be, what, TTC, right? Um, and then finally, you're going to add a DNA polymerase. Um, polymerase, ASE at the end, means this is an enzyme, okay? Um, and then a mixture of free nucleotides, so essentially just A's, T's, C's, and G's um, to the separated strands. And you heat it again to around 75 degrees Celsius, and then that is the entire process. So the outcome is a doubling of the number of DNA strands. And each time you run, PCR is going to double, right? So if you start with one, you could double to two, and then four, and then eight, 16, 32, and so on and so forth. Um, and each cycle only takes about two minutes to finish. So in a very short amount of time, we can create a ton of copies of some, a strand of DNA that we want to study. All right, so advantages of PCR, or polymer, polymerase chain reactions. Um, so minute amounts of DNA can be used for amplification. And DNA degraded to fragments, only a few hundred base pairs in length, can also serve as effective templates for amplification. So we can study DNA that's degraded, um, DNA that's a little bit older, uh, DNA that we have very small amounts of. Large numbers of copies of specific DNA sequences can be amplified simultaneously. Um, with multiplex PCR reactions, and commercial kits are available. So um, these are, you know, fairly inexpensive um, pieces of equipment. Um, you can buy one for just a few hundred dollars and do these to copy DNA. All right. Um, the last big benefit of PCR is that contaminant DNA, so DNA not from humans, okay, so fungal or bacterial, will not amplify because it's using human-specific primers. Um, however, human contamination can still be a problem. All right, gel electrophoresis. This is a technique used to separate fragments of DNA. So essentially, um, we take an electrical current and it is moved through a gel substance, and that causes those short little chunks of DNA that we cut um, using RFLP um, into or through the gel. So smaller, lighter molecules or smaller, lighter chunks of DNA will move farther in the gel and heavier chunks will stay closer towards the beginning, right? So after developing those fragments can be visualized for characterization. All right, and this is just kind of showing the um, techniques. If you go to college, you'll definitely and take all and take a, an advanced level biology or forensics course. Um, you'll definitely end up doing this. Um, but essentially, you start by pipetting the DNA, and then you load the DNA into the gel wells. So the next slide, I believe, shows an image. Yeah. So here is a gel. Okay, and here you can see these little cuts. Um, those are the wells. You take your pipette and you inject it into those wells. Um, and then you run the gel. So when you run the gel, what you're doing essentially, let's go back here, is you are activating these positive and negative electrodes 
and that's what caused the DNA to start moving through that gel. So when it runs, you're going to see these very defined lines, and those are called bands, okay? And we can observe and compare those bands of DNA. All right, the next method we're going to talk about is STR, which stands for short tandem repeats. Um, this is another method of DNA typing. So STRs are locations. Um, when we're talking about DNA, we refer to them as loci on the chromosome that contain short sequences of two to five bases that repeat themselves in the DNA molecule. So this um, method is advantageous um, because it provides greater discrimination. It requires less time and a smaller sample size, and the DNA is less susceptible to de degradation. So here is an example of some of those STR loci um, and the chromosomal positions. Once again, not going to expect you to know these, but it's kind of interesting to see. Um, and obviously, we can also look at this and get some information about the human. So, for example, looking at um, this, we can tell that this person was XY, which means that they are a male. Okay. Um, and they have 22 um, somatic chromosomes, so that's perfectly normal. That's what we expect to see, right? All right, so the STR procedure, this is going to extract the gene THO1 from the sample. Um, so THO1 has seven human variants with a repeating sequence of AATG. And then you amplify that sample using PCR. Remember, that's polymerase chain reaction. And then we separate once again using gel electrophoresis and examine the distance the STR migrates to determine the number of times that the THO1 repeats. So each person has two STR types, um, one from each parent. So by continuing the process with additional STRs from other genes, you can narrow down the probability of DNA belonging to only one person, right? the likelihood of someone having the same exact SCR genes from different parents is very unlikely. Um, SCR typing is visualized by peaks shown on a graph, so each represents the size of the DNA fragment, and then the possible alleles are numbered for each locus. So once we run all these tests, the next thing we have to look at is probability. Um, so databases have been established to determine how often a particular allele on a locus appears in a given population. So by increasing the number of alleles on a different loci, the probability of having two people with the exact combination becomes smaller, right, or minuscule. All right, now this website used to have an STR animation demonstration. Um, it no longer works, so we're going to skip past that. All right, so the three possible outcomes from all of this. The first one would be a match, so the DNA profile appears the same, um, and then the lab will then look at charts and information to um, determine the frequency of that particular you know, um, combination. Exclusion, uh, the genotype comparison shows profile differences that can only be explained by the samples originating from different sources or inconclusive, so the data does not support a conclusion as to whether or not the profiles match. Um, types of DNA, there are two. Uh, we have nuclear. This is going to be found in the nucleus. It contains 23 pairs of chromosomes inherited from both parents, and then each cell only contains one nucleus. The other type is mitochondrial. It is found in the cytoplasm. It comes from your mother. Um, and then each cell contains hundreds to thousands of mitochondria and this is the one that can often be found in skeletal remains. Nuclear DNA is present in the head of sperm. Mitochondrial DNA is present in the tail. So at conception, the head of the sperm enters the egg, the tail falls off, and then you lose your father's mitochondrial DNA. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is more, the analysis is more rigorous, time-consuming, and costly, um, so it's very rarely done. This DNA is a loop or a circle, and there's only 37 genes. Um, it is used when nuclear DNA typing is not possible. And last but not least, FBI's CODIS database. This is the combined DNA index system. It's used for linking serial crimes and unsolved cases. Uh, it was launched in 1998 and links all 50 states. Um, I hope you are having a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.